Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to uh, talk to you today. And I'm happy to be able to um, share a little bit about what, we're, what we've been doing uh, to, development, treat, to develop treatment strategies to restore PLA2G6 enzyme function in an INAD. Um, I'm Paul Kotzbauer, I'm in, and I'm at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. So here's a diagram of the PLA2G6 gene. And I think most people know that, that mutations in this gene cause INAD. Um, the gene encodes a protein that's also called PLA2G6, but it's been known by other names, including group six phospholipase A2. Um, a variety of different mutations have been found um, in children with INAD, and they range from mutations that change, you know, just cause a single misspelling uh, in, the, in the gene to other mutations that kind of, um, that essentially stop the ability to produce uh, protein from the gene. And then there are a few mutations in red that cause uh, a disorder referred to as dystonia Parkinsonism that I won't talk about today. <clears throat> so what does the PLA2G6 protein do? What does the protein encoded by this gene um, do? How does it function? We've focused a fair amount of our effort on understanding that. It's, uh, the protein is an enzyme and enzymes are important for a variety of different functions and in, in cells and in the body. And this enzyme um, functions to break apart specific lipid molecules. It, it, it catalyzes several different reactions, but in both cases, it takes a lipid molecule and converts it to a fatty acid plus another lipid molecule. And these lipid molecules are important for a variety of functions in the cell, um, ranging from um, energy production to kind of the, the building and, and maintenance of, of membranes that surround each cell and that also surround um, compartments within, within the cell. So one of the things we've done is set up a system to actually study the function of the protein uh, in the lab, either in test tubes or in cells. And so what we can do is we can produce the protein and we can produce protein that, ha that is either kind of the normal or wild type protein found in most people or the PLAG6 protein that contains uh, mutations that are, that are associated with, with INAD, that cause INAD. And then we can, after producing those proteins, we can measure its enzyme function in a variety of different ways. Um, and, and when we do that, as shown here, what we find is that the mutations interfere with the, the ability of this protein to function as an enzyme. Um, so we can measure how well it converts lipid molecules to, to fatty acids and, and find that when, when there's uh, mutations present, um, almost entirely as a rule, uh, the, the mutant enzyme is not able to function properly. And based on that, we can predict consequences of, of this loss of enzyme function in INAD. One is that too much of the things PLA2G6 breaks down will accumulate, and that could be phospholipids and lysophospholipids. And, and we believe that's consistent with what we can see um, when we uh, look at brain tissue, either from mouse model or from um, patients who have had INAD and passed away and donated their brain for research. Um, where we see in these neuroxonal steroids, we see as diagrammed here, um, lipids uh, accumulating uh, inside the, the axons and dendrites, the processes of the neurons um, in the brain and peripheral nervous system. The other thing we can't see under the microscope um, is that there's going to be too little of the things that PLA2G6 would normally make, and those are the fatty acids. And so there's not gonna be enough of these um, needed for either energy production or to make membranes. Another approach we we've, we've focused on, especially early on, was to develop a mouse model. And we did this in collaboration with another lab at Washington University many years ago, um, where a targeted mutation in the mouse PLA2G6 gene was made. Um, and, and these mice have been very well characterized and they make essentially no PLA2G6 proteins. And we believe that that nicely um, simulates what happens um, in children with INAD. And then we've studied these mice and find that um, they do over time develop neurological problems. And we've developed ways to measure these neurologic problems 
Um, and, and one of those ways we've shown here where we can, we can time how long they're able to stay on a, a rotating rod, which requires a lot of balance and coordination. And the wild type mice are able to stay on for a long time and get better with successive trials. And the knockout mice don't do very well at all, even if they keep trying um, over successive trials. And then the other thing we see in these mice is that they, they have the neuroaxonal spheroids that really are very characteristic of what we see for human INAD. Um, we can see that with different staining methods when we look at brain tissue under the microscope. And then when we use an electron microscope, we can also see the very characteristic uh, accumulation of lipid molecules in these neuroaxonal spheroids. And these spheroids increase as the mice age. So we've used kind of those two, two things, understanding how the enzyme functions and the mouse model to think about treatments for INAD. And uh, for a number of years, we've been focusing on strategies to restore the PLA2G6 enzyme function. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about several different strategies. One strategy is gene therapy. And we believe in the long run, this offers um, great promise uh, because in theory, it can, we, we, we can completely compensate for the loss of PLA2G6 protein as a result of these mutations. The strategy is to deliver new copies of the PLA2G6 gene that substitutes for the mutant gene and produces fully functional protein. Um, the challenge though is that uh, it's, still, it's still being developed. And, and the biggest challenge is the, the ability to effective de effectively deliver the PLA2G6 gene to the spinal cord and brain. And that's particularly challenging for INAD because um, we know that we need we know that uh, the disease is affecting many different areas of the brain and spinal cord, and therefore we need to get the gene um, throughout the brain and spinal cord as well as the peripheral nervous system. But we've begun our work um, using our mouse model. We've made gene therapy vectors, which are really just kind of um, the shell of a, of, of a virus that, that, you, that, you know, that encapsulates the gene you want to deliver. In order for that, that gene therapy vector to deliver the gene and have the, the beneficial effect that we want, it's got to do a couple things. It's got to get across the blood brain barrier um, and it's got to then get inside cells um, to, deliver, to deliver the gene, uh, ideally to as many cells as possible and ideally to 100% of the cells um, in the brain and spinal cord. So our vectors, we don't think we've, we've reached 100% um, and it's not an easy thing to measure, but we've developed measurement strategies and what we've seen is that when we use these vectors and inject them into mice um, that are young, but not newborn mice. So these are, these are mice that have a blood brain barrier. Um, and when we inject, um, when we inject the, 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 the gene therapy vectors and then measure production of protein, we can measure it when we, we, infect, when we inject a couple of different uh, types of vector preparations. We're able to measure pretty good production of of the PLA2G6 protein and can also measure it in liver as well. Uh, we've gone on from there to look at safety because that's an important first question. And so far we don't see any safety issues uh, when we've observed the mice for 14 months after injection. So that's good. Um, the question now is, does it help? Uh, and so far uh, we haven't seen a beneficial effect that we hope to see. Uh, certainly haven't given up. Um, and, and have a number of ideas to uh, improve the effectiveness. Uh, but we tried a couple early experiments, really wanting to kind of simulate how this would work if we used it as a treatment for, for children with INAD. So um, injecting it into mice um, um, that are at you know, seven weeks of age or, or older um, with a fully mature blood brain barrier. At seven weeks of age for these mice, they haven't really begun to manifest too many problems uh, from the disease, maybe just a, some subtle changes in the, in the brain tissue that we can see under the microscope, but they, they have normal neurologic function. So we inject it and then we wait until they would normally develop problems, which is out to about 12 months. And we measure their behavior like I showed you before. And in this case, we did not see a problem um, um, or we did not see an improvement in the neurologic problems uh, for the mice when we gave them this treatment. Similarly, if we waited and injected them shortly before um, they begin to develop problems and then test them, again, we didn't see an improvement um, with, in, in this experiment with this particular strategy for delivering 
the gene therapy vectors. As I said, we, you know, we've learned a lot from these experiments and we have um, ideas. It's, it's, in some ways it's, it's disappointing because we used you know, a method with, with kind of newer vectors that are known to deliver, at least in mice, um, to effectively deliver genes to the brain. And we did get delivery, um, but it doesn't seem to be good enough. We didn't seem to be able to get it to as enough cells in the brain um, and, to, and to the various you know, cells or neuronal populations in the brain that need to get it um, to, to result in an improvement. Um, so we're thinking about improvements in vector, the delivery method, the dose, and even, and an even, even different gene variants that exist um, as we continue to pursue this, this strategy. And I wanna briefly touch on a few other strategies we're thinking about. One is known as an enzyme replacement strategy um, in which we want to deliver a new PLAG6 protein, um, not the gene, but the protein to replace um, the mutated protein in INAD. And this too could completely compensate for the loss of function. Um, but this is, I would say at this stage for PLA2G6, even more challenging than gene therapy. Um, and yet we began to investigate it, not only perhaps for the, you know, for the possibility of using it as a traditional enzyme replacement therapy, which can work for some, some disorders, um, disorders caused by uh, mutations in lysosomal enzymes, um, but so far not necessarily for other disorders like INAD. Um, and, and enzymes like the PLAGG6 protein. Um, but we're also thinking about whether it can even help us for gene therapy. Um, and so we're, we're, our approach is to add, kind of modify the protein, add tags that can pr promote its ability to be exchanged between cells. So that if you get it, if you get the protein to some cells, they may be able to release uh, protein or, or exchange it with, with surrounding cells. And in that way, you can be more effective in getting, um, getting treatment to all the cells that need it. And then, and then the last strategy I wanted to talk about today um, was a strategy we call pharmacologic chaperones. Um, and this strategy is to try and identify traditional drug um, type molecules that could improve the function of the mutant PLA2G6 protein. Um, when I showed you our measurements of, of mutant PLA2G6 protein, um, I showed you that it was substantially decreased relative to the normal or wild type protein. Um, but in many cases, it's not zero. And our, uh, the thinking about this, and it's being pursued for other, other genetic disorders as well, is that in many cases, it's just a single misspelling, one amino acid out of 800 in the protein that's, that's not right. Um, as a result, the protein can't normally fold in this very precise three-dimensional shape and remain stable and function. Um, but in some cases, a drug that interacts with a protein can help stabilize it. And so that's the idea here. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging product because drug screening is always challenging. Um, but we've begun, to, we, we've begun to explore whether it's feasible and whether it could be a successful approach in the long run. And as I'll touch on, it could also help, potentially help the gene therapy approach as well. So we've done some proof of concept experiments and suggest that it can, you know, that it can be done at least for some mutations that cause INAD. And we've developed ways to measure the function kind of even more sophisticated than what I showed you early on where we can track the activity of the protein over time, see how stable it is. Um, and we found one molecule, ATP, which is the, uh, you know, an energy molecule used in cells. It can't be used as a drug, um, but, but some studies had shown before that it might work in this way. And, and we did some measurements and, and not only did it help boost the activity of the wild type protein, the normal PLAGG6 enzyme, but also one of the mutant proteins, R741W that we studied as well. And we've done some other proof of concept experiments that suggest that yes, you, you know, in certain ways, you can um, boost or you know, improve the activity of PLA2G6 protein containing a mutation uh, and, and make it more stable. Um, and we went on to set up a way to screen and see if we could identify some drugs that would have this effect. Drugs that, you know, small molecules that could actually be you know, used, used as a drug. Um, we spent a lot of effort developing an assay and actually set up a screen looking at kind of existing drugs, whether any existing drugs or other kind of well-characterized natural um, products might have this desired effect. Um, unfortunately, it did not, you know, in, in the screen we did, which I thought was a good screen, um, did not identify any kind of hits, you know, positive, positive drugs or compounds that really had a substantial effect, maybe very modest effects, but but not, you know, not significant enough to, to move on 
and this project. And we think for kind of further, you know, further efforts in this, you know, in this line um, have, have worked to develop kind of improved cell-based assays that we could use uh, for further screens. So just to, just to summarize, um, I told you that INAD is caused by loss of PLAGG6 enzyme function. Um, we're, we're using a mouse model and enzyme measurements to um, focus on developing strategies to restore the function of the PLAGG6 protein or enzyme as, as treatments for INAD. Um, and, and those strategies we're focusing on include um, gene therapy where we can deliver a replacement gene to restore production of a uh, fully functional PLHUG6 enzyme. An enzyme replacement therapy, a strategy where we would modify the protein itself so that we could deliver the protein, or we, you know, we really are, are interested in the idea that this could help improve the gene therapy strategy if we deliver a modified version of the gene, which produces a modified version of the protein, that protein could then get exchanged and reach more cells uh, than we otherwise would reach with the gene therapy. And then finally, the pharmacological chaperone approach um, to improve mutant PLA2G6 enzyme function, or in this case also, you know, since we can potentially boost the, the, the function of the wild type protein that we might be delivering in gene therapy could, could also improve the effectiveness of, of that approach. Um, so we think, you know, in combination, this is, um, this is a potentially effective approach to ultimately develop a treatment focusing you know, most on, on the gene therapy strategy, but recognizing that we still have work to do um, to, to translate this into an effective treatment. And then finally, I just wanna, wanna acknowledge some people in my lab uh, that have worked on these, uh, these projects over the years, uh, including Linda Wilmot, Rebecca Miller, uh, Todd Chakravorty, Shana Nabudala, and Joanna Lowe, other members of my lab, collaborators um, listed, listed on the right, here, including Mark Sands, who's working with us on the gene therapy. And then finally, I wanted to acknowledge support um, over the years, support from the National Institute of Health and NBI Disorders Association uh, with some of the kind of earlier strategies that we pursued that I haven't, uh, haven't had time to talk about today. Um, for the pharmacological chaperone, um, we appreciate the support from Ainsley, Ainsley's Angels, the Phillips Lamara Thompson Herschelman family and Jasper Valentine Foundation. And then more recently for the gene therapy that we've been project we've been pursuing, um, want to acknowledge support from the INAD Cure Foundation, uh, the Jasper Valentine Foundation and the Herschelman family. And, um, and I want to thank everyone for their attention and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today.